I uh, always enjoy our Wednesday noon Bible study because I always learn something from the people who are in that Bible study. Always some new insight. No matter how many times we read these stories, we'll find something new. And so it was this past Wednesday when some of our Bible study group noticed some details in this story, this very familiar story about the healing of Bartimaeus. It's different from some of the other healings. There's a story about Jesus healing a man who was born blind, but as one of our folks pointed out, this man had once upon a time been able to see because he says, let me see again. So he had lost his eyesight through an illness or an accident or something, and he was really bereft. In the ancient world, if you were blind, you were nobody, almost literally. There was no social service program of any kind. There were no readings for the blind. There was no uh, disability, no help for blind people. All he could do was have some people set him in front of the city gate and hope that he would collect enough change from donations to be able to survive. He had gone from being a person to being invisible, unnoticed. And when he hears that Jesus, the famous healer, is coming, we don't know if he knows anything about Jesus, but he certainly heard of him, and he knows somehow that he is connected to David, Jesus, son of David, this idea of this Messiah coming. And so he cries out, Jesus, wherever you are, come and save me. And the people around him are like, you're a beggar, you're supposed to be quiet. It's like children in the old days, be seen and not heard and preferably not seen. We don't believe that anymore. We like the kids to be seen and heard, even in church. It's wonderful. But this guy was supposed to just be invisible. He calls out again, son of David, have mercy on me. And then he gets his wish. He gets to meet Jesus. And Jesus asks him the question, what do you want me to do for you? Now, if this triggers a little memory, we just had that same question one or two Sundays ago when James and John were walking along the road arguing about who was going to be the greatest disciple. Remember that? And they said to Jesus, he asked them, hey, James and John, what do you want me to do for you? Same exact question. And what did they say? We want glory. We want this to mean something. We want to get a payoff at the end. And it also reminds us of another story that we heard recently. The rich young man who came to Jesus, and Jesus kind of asks him, what do you want me to do for you? And he says, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? So on the one hand, James and John want glory, and on the other hand, the rich young man wants uh, to live forever. And Jesus says to both of them, look, this path that I am walking is one of sacrifice. Are you really ready to do this? And the rich young man is not. He walks away sorrowful because he cannot part with his possessions. He's too connected to the things of this world. James and John hang in there, but barely, because they need to keep learning what it means to follow Jesus, to drink from his cup. It is Bartimaeus, this nobody, this invisible blind man, who finally gets it, according to Mark's gospel. Bartimaeus, who says, my teacher, let me see again. And Jesus says, now that I can answer. And he gives him his sight. Bartimaeus is willing to give up everything. He doesn't have much. All he has in the world is a cloak. But he throws it off. He tosses it aside so that he can rise up, spring up, and follow Jesus on the way. That phrase, follow Jesus on the way, is the language that was used in the early church to be a disciple. Before there ever was anything called the Christian church, there were the followers of the way. You and I are the inheritors of the followers of the way. And Bartimaeus is among the first of all the disciples to truly follow Jesus on the way. This invisible man, this no one, this beggar gets it and becomes a disciple. This is such an important story 
Because in the Bible, blindness is often not just a physical limitation. In the Bible, blindness can be a symbol for spiritual blindness, for missing the bigger picture, for not seeing what we're supposed to see. Many times Jesus talked about the religious leaders of his day and said, you guys are truly the blind ones. You're concerned about me healing a blind person, but you're blind to what God is doing right in front of you. And I think that is still true for us today. We suffer from spiritual blindness in many ways. One of the things that we need to be able to do is to open our eyes more clearly to see what God is doing in our midst and open our eyes with empathy and compassion to see those who have been invisible like Bartimaeus when he was sitting by the city gate. It was in a very interesting story this week, I thought uh, President Biden went to Arizona and he made a formal apology on Friday to those who had suffered in what were called Indian boarding schools. I don't know if you read that story or knew much about that. I learned a lot in that story. I'd heard of these schools. I knew, for example, in Canada and the United States, there were many children who were forcibly taken from their parents in order to, um, this horrible story, but the, the guy who kind of invented this idea was from Pennsylvania, and his slogan, which was adopted by these schools, was, kill the Indian, save the man. What did he mean by that? He meant the only way we can save these savages from themselves is to re-educate them, take them away from their families, from their culture, try to eliminate their culture and language, and refashion them as good American citizens. I believe the initial impulse was done out of a kind of desire to help but as we know now, after so many years, it caused enormous suffering and damage. They found in some of the places where these schools were set up, mass graves with children's bones in them because of the harsh treatment that some of these kids suffered. And imagine the parents being cut off from their children, often against their will. These schools ran from 1819 until 1969, 150 years of this policy of kind of remaking uh, Indians and trying to eradicate this culture. Uh, from our perspective, looking back, it's horrific to see this. And so it meant a lot when the President of the United States was willing to name this, to see it, to name it, and to apologize for the harm that was done to these people. Some of the Native American leaders said, well, you know, an apology is great, but some, pol some better policies would help, right? Would show us, you know, show me the money kind of thing. But I thought just the, the impact of that statement was powerful because it showed that people were finally looking at this. And it's no coincidence that this happened after the first Native American was appointed Secretary of the Interior. We've always had a Secretary of the Inter Interior managing Indian Affairs. This is the first time a Native American was put in that position and was able to raise up this issue and make it visible, help us to see. This is the kind of vision I think that God wants us to have. Instead of always avoiding the difficult issues, being courageous enough to turn our eyesight towards them. This operates in so many ways. It, it's in our own lives. When we look at the difficult things of our lives, there's a lot in my life I don't want to look at too closely. I don't want to look at some behaviors or patterns of life or attitudes, right? I just like to gloss over that and let me turn on the football game and not think about it. It's hard to face tough stuff in our own lives. It's hard to face tough stuff in our relationships and families. There's a lot that gets ignored because it's too uncomfortable for us to tackle hard conversations and issues in our workplace, our families, our friendships even. And I think this scripture is a call for us to be willing to open our eyes to see what maybe we've been afraid or unwilling to see. And in doing so, to be willing to throw off the cloak 
that sometimes is preventing us from doing what God wants us to do. In some ways, Bartimaeus could have lived a comfortable, a very unpleasant, but comfortable, familiar life sitting there in the gate of Jericho. It took courage for him to spring up and to be willing to follow Jesus because he did not know where Jesus was leading. Like James and John found out, following Jesus means often sacrificing the things that we hold dear, the privileges, the the comforts, the concepts that maybe we are clinging to for safety or for a sense of comfort. And it takes courage to open our eyes to see the needs of so many people. In a few minutes, Dean Tierney's gonna talk about our continuing outreach efforts, and I think that is so important. What we do in outreach is so valuable. But the most valuable thing from my perspective is not the money that is donated or the clothing or the food. It is the willingness to see in those who are most vulnerable, often most invisible in our community, to really open our eyes to see them as full human beings, made like us in the image of God, infinitely precious in God's eyes. And in that vision, to be willing to be transformed ourselves as disciples of Jesus, as followers on the way. In our Old Testament lesson, Job himself had to come to a new vision. I had heard with my ears, but now, he says, I see with my eyes. May we see with our eyes the amazing things that God is doing in us and through us in this world. May we open our eyes with empathy and compassion to our brothers and sisters in need. And may we have the courage to spring up and to follow Jesus on the way. Amen.